This podcast is for healthcare professionals only and is brought to you by core to ad Medical Affairs in collaboration with Manorini Stemline. Aditya, good morning. Um, this is exciting for us to be talking about the ear positive metastatic breast cancer and just uh, key insights on Elicestron uh, and the latest uh, in the uh, Emerald uh, subset uh, analysis. Absolutely. Looking forward to the discussion. So uh, I guess I'll start with a few questions. So wh- first of all, let's start from the beginning. What is the f- uh, the standard of care in that first line therapy in HR positive HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer? In general, I use endocrine therapy plus a CDK4-6 inhibitor as first-line therapy for a patient with metastatic hormone receptor positive breast cancer. Uh, And that's based on multiple studies, including studies that have shown improvement in overall survival with this approach. So that pretty much is my first line. And then after a patient has disease progression on first-line therapy in the second-line setting, I strongly recommend genotyping, plasma-based genotyping, because I find that actionable. And that's exactly the the point. So one of the issues that we have, right, after the patient's cancer is is progressing on endocrine therapy is endocrine resistance. So once that that cancer becomes endocrine resistant, then what do we do, right? We have to to kind of look at the mechanism behind endocrine resistance. And one of the, the, the ways to do this is by doing genomic testing, exactly. Say you do genotyping and you find ESR1 mutation, that's very actionable, uh, A, in terms of potential therapies and also provides insight into potential mechanism of resistance. If a tumor has developed ESR1 mutation, it would signal that it's likely dependent, still dependent on the ER pathway as opposed to some other alteration. So I find that very valuable. But a point I would make is that these are acquired mutations. So it's important to do liquid biopsy or plasma-based genotyping. If we profile the original you know, primary breast cancer or even the biopsy that was done at the time of metastatic diagnosis, you can miss these mutations. And that's an extremely important point that, that you made. These are subclonal events, right? And so if we do a solid tumor biopsy, we have around a 20% or so chance of missing it because another site might have developed it. But all of these sites are going to shed their DNA into the blood and therefore captured with the liquid biopsy. So let's say a patient does have a tumor that has now developed an ESR1 mutation. What is your, your go-to strategy after that? Well, we now have an FDA-approved therapy. Uh, Elacestrant is approved for patients who have detectable ESR1 mutations, and the clinical trial liquid biopsy was used for the detection of ESR1 mutation. So this was based on the Emerald study. The Emerald study demonstrated Elacestrant was superior to standard-of-care endocrine therapy for patients in the second-line plus setting In the Emerald trial, all patients had received prior CDK4-6 inhibitor, about 20% had received prior chemotherapy, Um, 30% had received uh, two prior lines of therapy. The primary endpoint of the trial was to look at progression-free survival between ELA assistant was a standard of care. The study had two primary endpoints, one looking at the efficacy in the overall population and a second primary endpoint of looking at Elacestrant was a standard of care in patients with detectable ESR1 mutations. And overall, the study met its primary endpoint in in both these categories. Overall, there was improvement in progression-free survival with Elacestrant was a standard of care in the total population. And if we look at patients with detectable ESR1 mutation, again, there was improvement in progression-free survival with Elacestrant was a standard of care endocrine therapy that was uh, clinically meaningful and statistically significant as well with a hazard ratio of 0.55. And since uh, a subset of patients had received prior chemotherapy, the team also looked at progression-free survival in patients who did not receive prior chemotherapy. And in that subgroup, you could see that the median progression-free survival with elacestrant was 5.3 months Uh, versus 1.9 months with standard chemotherapy. So in the second line setting where uh, elacestrant is often used, it's helpful to have these data um, in terms of options. And in Virginia, you did some very nice subgroup analyses presented at SABCS. You want to highlight in terms of what that represents and how the analysis was done and what it means? 
Yeah, I think our point was exactly that. There was a, a drop in the beginning with many patients probably having endocrine-resistant disease that was not going to respond to any endocrine therapy. And so how do we tease out the patients that still have endocrine-sensitive disease? And so the way we looked at that is we looked at prior duration of a CDK4-6 inhibitor, and we found that if the prior duration of the CDK4-6 inhibitor was at least 12 months, then the, the benefit from elicestrant was clinically meaningful with a median PFS at that point of 8.6 months. So now, interestingly, the standard of care arm, regardless of me, what median duration of the prior CDK we looked at, still was at around 1.9 to 2 month median PFS. So that to me tells me if a tumor has an ESR1 mutation, uh, and, and the patient has received already a CDK4-6 inhibitor, which is the majority of these patients, uh, you don't want to give just standard of care endocrine therapy. The, the results are really not, not impressive. You want to do something different. And elicestrin seems to be that. Now, we also looked at a lot of other analyses because we were still trying to tease out patient populations that may not benefit as much from elicestrin or may, may benefit more and so forth. So we looked at patients that had bone metastases versus liver and lung metastases. It really didn't make any difference as long as the prior duration of the CDK was 12 months or more. We looked at co-mutations, PIG3CA, P53, and again, it didn't really ma make, make a difference. Still, there was a nice clinically significant benefit with, with elicestrin looked at HER2 low tumors or not, and we even looked at different ESR1 mutations. And again, it didn't seem to matter. The, the important thing seemed to be the prior duration of the CDK4-6 inhibitor. That's very helpful because now you have these different subgroups, uh, ESR1 plus PIK3CA mutant, which can be seen in clinic. And so to see efficacy of, e of elicestrin in that setting was very helpful, plus other uh, subgroup analyses as well lung, liver, meds, uh, bone meds only. So how do you incorporate this in clinical practice? Let's look at a scenario, Virginia. There's a patient um, postmenopausal, say in a 60-year-old um, female who gets uh, AI plus CDK4-6 inhibitor first line that works for about uh, two years or so, and the patient has disease progression. You get genotyping and it shows uh, ESR1 mutation or it shows both ESR1 and PIK3C, these two scenarios, how would you incorporate that in terms of decision-making? So I think that's where you have to look at efficacy, but also toxicity. We have now three agents, two approved in the exact same setting that you just mentioned, capibacertive and alpelisib, but those are in combination with endocrine therapy. So when you look at the toxicity of that regimen, the dual regimen of capivacertive plus endocrine therapy or alpelisib and endocrine therapy, and you compare that to the, the toxicity profile of elicestrin, elicestrin is as much fewer toxicities than the combination therapy. So if there's a commutation, I'll likely give elicestrin first. Is that something that you do as well? Yeah, I agree. I think it's good to have options. And we start with the therapy that has lower side effects, and then you can move on to therapy that has more side effects. So I do consider a less assessment in this setting. Um, I do get scans closer to the two, two and a half month mark in this setting, just to ensure if a patient is having disease progression, we pick that early. And if that looks good, then you can space the scans out. But in this setting, just getting scans a bit early, I do find that helpful. And, and if you're going to talk to your patients about elicestrin, what do you mention as far as adverse events? That's a good point. So when you're discussing elicestrin in this setting, the common side effects that I review include nausea, which is the um, number one side effect seen with elicestrin in the clinical trial, usually grade one, grade two. The incidence of grade three, four uh, nausea in the clinical trials was 2.5%, so very low. Um, and generally, you don't need anti-nausea medications. There was no grade four nausea vomiting seen with elicestrin in the clinical trial. So that's the main thing I counsel patients about, generally taking elicestrin with food, and that takes care of the nausea. Uh, with uh, other combination drugs, there are more side effects, and, and we can review that. Now, we've, we've, we've had the data from Emerald, which is really a, a really uh, pivotal clinical trial, but thankfully, we also have real-world data because we've been using nilocestrin for a couple of years. Any conclusions from these trials that may not have, have really come up uh, from Emerald? Yeah, we have real-world analyses now, close to uh, more than 1,000 patients uh, treated with elicestrin, and we see consistent results that the median progression-free survival is in the eight to nine-month range, which was seen 
with uh, lecestrant in the emerald study in patients who had ESR1 mutations and prior duration of CDK4-6 inhibitor for at least 12 months. So we're seeing consistent results in the real world setting as well. And that's interesting because typically, right, when, when we do real world analyses, we found we find worse outcomes than we find in our randomized clinical trials. But here, both of these analyses pointed to, to, to better outcomes than what we've been used to in, uh, in, uh, in the Emerald trial, which is actually pretty, pretty interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it probably speaks to the drug being well tolerated. Sometimes in the real world setting, we see slightly inferior outcomes as compared to randomized trials because in randomized trials, there are motivated patients, their AEs are very well managed. Um, here, you know, the drug is very well tolerated. And maybe that's why in the real world setting, you see consistent results. So I guess I'll summarize a little bit what we've talked about. When we talk about patients that have previously received the CDK46 inhibitor, and now we're trying to make a decision as to what to give as our subsequent treatments. Extremely important that we do genomic testing. It's extremely important that we understand what the makeup of the tumor is and how it's evolved over time. If a tumor has an ESR1 mutation, and if we'd still consider the tumor endocrine sensitive, and the way we, you know, I define it clinically is by the prior duration of a CDK46 inhibitor, that's where I will introduce uh, LSestron for my patients. I think those scenarios, the, there's a, a nice clinical benefit with giving LSSTRN. Co-mutations are important for me for subsequent treatments since I've established my second-line therapy, but they're definitely patients that you might end up giving a CDK4-6 inhibitor uh, uh, as a second line or even a PI3 kinase inhibitor in that second line as well. But the majority of my patients would be getting uh, uh, LSSTRN. Any other things to consider, uh, Aditya? No, that's the key. Do pl plasma genotyping in the second line setting, and then based on that, uh, choose therapies. Uh, ESR1 mutation, elastestrant, ESR1 plus PIK3C mutation, again, elastestrant is a consideration. Uh, and it's regardless of the type of ESR1 mutation. Now, there was some data with fulvestrin previously that uh, Y537S, um, those ESR1 mutations are resistant to fulvestrin, but we've not seen that with elastestrin per se. So it's regardless of the type of uh, ESR1 mutation. And also in terms of safety, safety analyses demonstrated that elastestrin has a manageable safety profile similar to endocrine therapies without any of the toxicities that we see with uh, PA3 kinase, AKT, mTOR, CDK4-6 inhibitors. So uh, comparatively, a very uh, manageable safety profile. And I think it's important to note, Aditya, that the, the amount of that antiemetics that was given on elicestrin was actually lower than in the patients that received an aromatase inhibitor in Emerald. And so around 8% of patients received an antiemetic if they were on elicestrin, 10% on an aromatase inhibitor, which I think is important for our practice. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, this is great, Virginia. I very much uh, enjoyed our discussion. It was uh, good to review the different options and look forward to uh, future discussions as well. I do as well. Thank you. The views expressed in this podcast are the personal opinions of the experts. They do not necessarily represent the views of the experts' organizations or academic institutions. For expert financial disclosures, please visit this Court to Add Medical Affairs program on the website.